Hi, today, we're gonna continue where we've ended last time. In the last episode, I have shown you that it is not that hard to define all polygons based on a complete ridge crease pattern. I hope I've managed to prove you that ridge creases are the only creases you really need in order to be able to define polygons position and size. Still, during the crease pattern analysis we may run into specific types of polygons. In this episode we're gonna talk about these special cases. Also, in this episode, we will talk about the ways of dealing with an excess of paper. Have you already seen any special polygons? Can you imagine how a special polygon looks like? I am almost 100% sure that you haven't seen it. How so? Maybe because it does not look that different, but the difference is, though subtle, still important. Let's take a look once again at our last example to see if something's different, if there's some small detail that we might have missed. If we look at the crease pattern, everything is more or less clear, except the fact that there are two squares in the lower left corner, for which we don't know what they represent. For example, we could argue that it is a river. But there is a small problem. I mean, it is not a problem per se, but there is no sense to have a river that doesn't encircle any polygon. So, what do these two squares represent? Well, if they are not a river then they must be a flap. Try to remember this. These two squares are a flap, but a flap that looks a little bit different. It is different in the sense that this flap is of the same width all along. In other words, the flap's tip isn't pointed as usual. It is as white as the rest of the flap. It is one unit wide. Okay, I'll show you what this kind of flap looks like. We will partially fold our model so that we can observe the final result. Can you see it? This is our flap. Do you see the difference in the flap's point width? As far as the flap's length is concerned, it is still one unit long. The fact that the tip is not pointed and that we had to use one additional square for that matter, doesn't affect the flap's length. To make this even clearer, let's go through a few additional examples. Let's analyze this base for instance. Even though this crease pattern seems complex, in reality it is not. Believe me, when you gain more experience, all of this will be quite simple. In this case again we can determine right away where the flaps are. Do you see them? Now we can add a river. This is even easier. Do you see how the river is supposed to look like? Okay, now I'd like you to go back and analyze polygons in the upper left and right corners. We already know that these polygons are flaps. There's no doubt about it. If you take a closer look at it, you'll soon realize that these polygons are exactly the same as the ones we've had in the previous example. Except that these flaps are two units long. If they are the same as the ones in the previous example, then it isn't hard to figure out that these two flaps are the flaps whose tips aren't pointed. These two are two unit long flaps with wide tips. Interesting, isn't it? But the same can be found even at flaps that are not at a paper corner. As a matter of fact, flaps with wide tips can be found at any part of a paper. Let me show you one extremely simple example. This one is almost the same as the one I showed you at the beginning of this course. However, this time our very simple example is a little bit modified, so I can show you how a wide-tipped flap looks like when it is situated on a paper edge. As already said, this example is very simple, so we can immediately define four polygons in paper corners. We can define a river as well. Do you see how straight it is? What's left now is the central piece of the paper. Do you see it? Okay, we have to find out what this part of the paper represents. We can assume that this part of the paper is a river, but again, we'd be faced with the already mentioned problem of having a river that doesn't encircle any polygons. So this is obviously not a river. If it is not a river then it has to be a flap, a flap that is very similar to the one we've already had in the previous example, except that this one isn't in the corner. This one is on the paper edge. To be more precise, this is a one unit long flap with a wide tip. I'll show you how this type of the flap looks like. Do you see? We have a one unit long flap without a pointed tip. I hope this is more or less clear. Now you must ask yourself. What about flaps in the middle of a paper? Well, nothing special. Everything is the same. I can show you an example with such a flap. 
As you can see, this example is also very simple. We can immediately define polygons on paper edges. Do you see them? Now, as always, we have to ask ourselves what the remaining part of the paper represents. We can again argue that this could be a river, but we won't. You can most likely assume that this is not a river, since it hasn't been one as well in any of our previous examples. It is, as you might have guessed, a flap with a wide tip. Okay, to make things absolutely clear, I'll show you how to fold this kind of the flap. It is a little bit more complicated, since we have a central flap, but do not worry, it is not that hard. Let's take a look at this model. At first glance it might seem that the central flap has disappeared, but it is not. If we unfold the model a little bit, we will found our central flap here inside. Can you see it? It is little bit awkwardly placed, but it is nevertheless here. So what have we learned? Let's try to define it as some kind of a rule. Whenever we add additional squares into a polygon center, we end up having a flap with a wide tip. Simple as that. I hope this is clear. Whenever we add additional squares into a polygon center, original squares are spaced out. Okay, this example is for the central element however, the same approach applies to all polygons, regardless of their position. The only difference arises from the fact that we haven't had whole elements in previous examples. Thus although they seem different, they are actually not. For instance, if we have a polygon on a paper edge, then a half of the polygon is out of the paper. I hope this looks familiar. We had this kind of example. The same applies to the polygons in the paper corner. Everything is the same, except that we do not see three quarters of the polygon. I hope everything is getting clearer now. The theory behind this kind of flaps is not that hard. But before we finished with this topic, I have one interesting question. This crease that connects V-shaped ridge creases, to which type of crease it belongs? What do you think? Okay, I will tell you. It is ridge crease. You see, setting two ridge creases apart in the same polygon, and this is exactly what we have done, is not allowed. Unless we introduce another crease that will connect them in order to form a single unified ridge crease structure. Remember this, all wide-tipped flaps have a crease that connects these two V-shaped ridge creases. No matter if this flap is in the corner, on the paper edge or in the middle of a paper. Therefore, this horizontal crease cannot be anything but a ridge crease. Okay? Now, you most probably thinking. Something is not right. Didn't we say that ridge creases are lines that go at 45 degree angle? Well, we did, I have to admit. Truth is that as far as polygon packing method is concerned, ridge creases are almost without an exception at an angle of 45 degrees. Unfortunately, as we just saw, this is not entirely true, but we have resorted to such a definition, since it is simple and understandable. In other words, ridge creases are almost always at 45 degree angle, but they do not have to be. I have just shown you one of these rare exceptions. But nevertheless this crease is a ridge crease. Remember that. With this we have gone through all the elements one can come across in the standard crease pattern. When I say standard, I mean a crease pattern that doesn't have some elaborate, advanced elements such as level shifters or Pythagorean stretch elements. With reference to this episode, I have added 10 small examples that use a 8x8 grid. On all of them only ridge creases are present. My suggestion is to analyze these examples and to try to define all polygons. Some of the examples have already been explained. Nevertheless, try to solve them too. It's gonna be a great practice. Now, before we finish this episode, I'd like to address the problem of unused parts of the paper. You see, up until now we have analyzed only already existing crease patterns, meaning, we've already had a crease pattern, and then tried to find out what it represents. This kind of approach was chosen because I believe that by analyzing a crease pattern itself you can learn a lot. But now we're gonna try a different approach. We're gonna try to devise our own crease pattern. However, bear in mind that for the time being we won't define the orientation of our crease pattern. This is something we're gonna leave for the next episode. Okay, let's first take a look at the stick figure in the upper right corner of the screen. Do you see what it is made of? So, we have one large 5 unit long flap, and right next to it a smaller one, a 3 unit long flap. Both of them are separated by two rivers from the other two sets of flaps. Each of these sets consists of two flaps, one and two units long. So what do we know? 
We know that we have to pack one circle 5 units in radius, also one circle 3, two circles 2 and of course, two circles 1 unit in radius. Doing this we have to be constantly aware that it isn't irrelevant how these circles are grouped, meaning we have to be sure that proper circles are next to one another and that we have left enough room for a river that separates two larger polygons from the rest. One additional question. Will an 8x8 grid be enough? It will. Take my word for it. So let's begin. First let's draw the circles in their corresponding polygons. This is one of the possible arrangements. Do you see how all circles and its polygons are organized in groups of two? Just the way they are organized on the stick figure. The flaps that touch each other on the stick figure have polygons touching each other on the crease pattern. Note something else as well. The largest polygons are in the paper corners. This is because in this way we are using the least paper space. Thus we should whenever possible, position larger polygons into the paper corners, or at least on its edges. Okay, we've positioned all the circles in their polygons. What's next? What's missing? Rivers, of course. Okay, let's add rivers. If we take a look at the stick figure, we'll notice that we need two rivers. One separating the first pair of small flaps from the rest of the model, and the second one that will separate the second pair. Meaning, these rivers should encircle the small polygons on the crease pattern. So, here is one river and here is the other one. Do you see how they completely encircle these two groups of small polygons? Theoretically, this is supposed to be it. But there is a small problem. There are four squares that do not belong to any of the polygons. And this is not allowed. I've already told you, in polygon packing method all the paper must be used. There cannot be any unused paper parts. With this we've come to the problem I've wanted to address. What can be done about unused squares? Well, there is more than one option. The simplest approach is to incorporate them into the rivers. We can incorporate these two squares into the nearest adjacent river. The river is now a little bit more complex, but it is still okay. Everything still goes by the rules. The same can be done with another two squares. We can simply incorporate them into the blue river. Do you see what we've just done? This was the simplest approach. It's used very often. But if you still remember, the whole river will be folded into a single square in the final model. This means that, if the river is complex, there could be more than a few layers of paper in a single square. And if we incorporate all the unused squares into the rivers, these squares are going to be even thicker. I'm not saying that this will be a problem, but it might be. So, if we want to avoid this, what other options or approaches do we have on our disposal? If we don't incorporate these unused squares into the river, then the only alternative is to incorporate them into one of the flaps. The first possibility is to incorporate these squares into one of the smaller flaps so that it turns into a flap with a wide tip. I hope you still remember this. We were talking about this just a few moments ago. So, take a good look. Do you see the idea? A polygon has been moved toward the center of the paper. The same can be done with the other two unused squares. But what if it's not possible to have such an elegant solution? What would happen if there were no so suitably positioned polygons? Would it still be possible to incorporate these unused squares into one of the flaps? The answer is of course. Yes. Okay, let me show you how to do it. Let's, for the sake of argument, try to incorporate remaining unused squares into the largest flap. In order to do so we have to use a little trick. We'll replace the 5 unit long flap with two things. A shorter flap, one that is 4 units long, and a river that separates the shorter flap from the rest of the model. Look at the stick figure. Do you see what we've just done? We've just divided one element, a flap, into two elements, a flap and a river. But note that a river that encircles only one flap is for all practical purposes a part of that flap. So, technically, nothing has really changed. And yet again, everything has changed. Now that we have a new river, we can incorporate the unused squares into it. What is the result? We've managed to incorporate all unused squares into the largest flap. And that's it. And last but not least, I'll show you all these examples in a folded form. This is our first example. The one where the unused squares were incorporated into the existing rivers. This is the second one. Here we have incorporated unused squares into the small flaps, so we've got a flaps with wide tip. And finally this is example in which we've incorporated unused squares into the largest flap. 
As you can see, all these bases look the same from the outside. Finally let's unfold these bases just to see how their crease patterns look like. As you can see, the crease patterns are different. But what is especially interesting is the fact that even though they are different, the result is still very similar, not to say almost identical. Therefore, remember. Different crease patterns can produce almost identical models. I hope you understand that. That'll be all for today. In the next episode we'll deal with the in-depth analysis of basic creases orientation. Once we do this, I hope you'll be capable of developing an origami model from scratch, from the idea to the final model.